Now I want to start off with talking a little bit about um, the um, emission control systems on the cars. I've got two guys here from California, so they'll 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 uh, they'll click they'll click and they'll holler if I make some gross error here. Um, oh, just before that, I did put in that link about the PBS show, uh, Iconic America, the Gadsden flag. So for the, those of you who clicked on that and watched it, because uh, there's a little segment in there about my son's platoon in Afghanistan, about my late son, and they also interviewed me. So anyway, thanks, uh, thanks for jotting those notes, kind notes back to me. Anyway, emission controls. So you say you get, well, you get a TC, you get a TD, you get a TF. MGA and early MGB, and you go, there's no emission controls on this. Well, there are. They're crude, they're coarse, but there are emission components on your car. There's an oil draft tube. The oil, <clears throat> oil draft tube on a T-type is about as big around as your thumb, comes off the left-hand side of the engine. As you skim across the, the, across the road, down the road, there's a vacuum underneath the car, and and some, some little bit of that vacuum draws air out of the engine. Um, that's the blow-by. That's the, the fumes of combustion that get past the rings and get down in the sump and would otherwise uh, contaminate the oil with sulfur compounds, nitrogen compounds, making acids. Anyone who's taken apart an old, old engine that's been sitting for 20, 30, 40 years, it looks like worms have, have dug holes in the rod bearings. It's so intense. Uh, the, uh, the action from the acid and the oil. So anyway, this, this oil draft tube keeps those, those fumes um, out of the engine. And where do they come from? Where does the air come from? There's a hose. There's a hose that goes from the valve cover to the air cleaner. Now on the TC, it's just a little bit of a nub. Um, and there's a little splash shield on the inside of the valve cover to keep oil from getting up into the air cleaner. On the TD, they didn't make a splash shield that was effective enough, but right away within the first 500 or 1,000 cars, they put a little restrictor inside the air cleaner so too much, so oil could not enter the oil filter from the engine. But sometimes, because too much oil is in the top of the engine, or because uh, the deflector's been misplaced, or something or other, you can you can get oil that washes from the engine into the air cleaner. This then prohibits the free flow of air getting into the engine, causes the engine to run rich, and eventually actually sucks some of the oil in. I just talked to a guy this past weekend who rebuilt his TD engine. Say what five? 6,000 bucks, only to have it continue smoking, only to find out that the problem wasn't the rings or the valve guides or anything else that he paid handsomely to have redone. It was only this little tiny restrictor um, in this oil bath air cleaner. So, gotta watch out for that stuff. Anyway, by the time we get to the TF now, there's a hose that goes from the front air cleaner to the valve cover. And again, less air enter the engine while it's running down the road and then gets sucked out of the oil draft tube underneath. But at idle, at idle, it tends to pull fumes in the opposite direction through the oil draft tube up into the engine and then into the air cleaner and into the engine. So that's the crude way of, of doing some emissions up through 1963. Because of the problems of the smog in Los Angeles and Cal in the state of California, in 1964, the engine on the MGB was changed from an 18G engine to an 18GA engine. What that meant only was that it had a Smith's PCV valve on it. It's a big mushroom-shaped job. I was going to bring one from the shop, but I forgot. And that sat on the center of the intake manifold from 1964 through 1968. It was plumbed to the front tappet inspection cover. So now there's a metering of, of air that's drawn out of the engine into the intake manifold. That metering is done through the oil filler cap. If you take the oil filler cap off while the engine's running, it invariably speeds up. 
because more air enters is able to enter the engine is more is able to come out of the side uh, side cover the front tappet inspection cover into the PCV valve and into the intake manifold and it raises the raises the uh, RPM. So that's that's great, but in 1968 now we have a whole host of things that come in. First of all, we've got emission standards that come in, and the U.S. government said to the automobile automobile manufacturers, your car has to pollute at a certain amount at these certain RPMs. Not necessarily under load, but they they made up this list of where it could pollute and how much. They didn't care how much it polluted between those points. It was only at those points under certain testing abilities that the government and the automobile manufacturers had. So starting in 1968 and nearly every year afterwards, the distributor changes because the easiest way to change emissions is to change the timing. I've said before, I think it's the 1968 TR250 that's got a vacuum advance and a vacuum retard on it, both a push-pull, so that um, it, it just it mechanically, they can come up and get the thing to, to um, emit the right, the, the, the fewest amount of pollutants that they, they could get at that point. So there's an air pump that's also installed in 1968 and runs right through 1980. That air pump shoots fresh air. It does two things. It shoots fresh air into the cylinder head right above the exhaust vent. There, the exhaust gases, which are extremely hot, coming out of the out of the uh, combustion chamber and incompletely combusted, get the addition of fresh air, and so the chemical reaction, the redox reaction, can continue throughout the length of the tailpipe. This addition of fresh air just helps helps get rid of the carbon monoxide and change it into carbon dioxide. Additionally, there's a gulp valve installed on the intake manifold, which registers the vacuum in the intake manifold. And when the vacuum gets too high, like deceleration or idle, it'll pull open, and especially deceleration, and allow air to be shot from the air pump into the intake manifold slowing deceleration. In addition, there are some little poppet valves, little tiny valves on the throttle disc. Those remain there from 1968 through 1980 on the MGBs. On the midgets, they go from a poppet valve in the SU carburetor to a little, um, a little diaphragm valve on the side of the Stromberg from 75 through, through 70. my mute all button. There we go. Here's my mute all button. That's that's why I've got it. So sometimes it's a barking dog. Sometimes it's it's uh, pots and pans or a phone ringing, but I don't think we've had a car alarm yet. So that's exciting. So that must be Peter's car alarm or something. Anyway, so we've, we've got this uh, overrun valve in the carburetor disc during periods of high manifold depression. That's That's deceleration. These valves open and allow more air and fuel to get into the combustion chamber than normally would get in there. If you're running down the road at 60 miles an hour, you take your foot off the gas completely, it goes, the throttle discs closed, and it goes, it goes into idle mode. There's not enough air fuel that can get through the carburetor into the, into the combustion chamber to combust. I mean, it draws some air in and the piston comes up and it compresses it, but it's just not enough. It's not enough air to combust. So you're shooting nearly raw air fuel down the tailpipe. Government does not want raw fuel in the air. So that's why they've put this air pump on. So that's the, that's the uh, smog system. The positive crankcase ventilation system begins in 1970. And we've got a charcoal canister 
that's installed above the driver's right knee on an MGB up, up underneath the firewall. And that's, uh, that's just filled with fish charcoal. That's charcoal. It's just like charcoal briquettes. You could cook, cook chicken on it if there was enough of it and it wasn't stinking of gasoline. Um, anyway, it's, it's uh, in, in, that, uh, in that charcoal canister and it's connected to the carburetor overflows, the carburetor vents. The only reason they're called overflows is because that's the only time you see them working is when gasoline's pumping out of there, which of course it should. It's supposed to be a line to get ambient air pressure from, from the atmosphere into the float bowl and press down on the gasoline in the float bowl. So that's what that vent is for. Um, anyways, hook up to the charcoal canister so that when you fill up your tank and the gasoline expands on a nice hot day and there's air fuel sitting above the gasoline in the tank, instead of being vented out into the atmosphere, raw fuel, instead it's taken up into the charcoal canister. Additionally, when you shut the, shut the engine off, the underbonnet temperature skyrockets and the gasoline in the float bowls expands. So there's air fuel there. Where does that go? That also goes into the charcoal canister. So we've got the charcoal canister that's, that's catching these fumes. Then during operation, fresh air is, is brought into the bottom of the charcoal canister, through the canister, out of the top of the canister, into the valve cover, and then out of the front tappet inspection cover, and then into the carburetors, 69 through 80, and it's burned up there. So a key, that is a good system. That charcoal canister is a wonderful system. It's, it's passive in that it requires no energy. Now, when it's working right, um, it, it, it does keep unburned hydrocarbons from entering the atmosphere. No problem. I mean, it doesn't hurt us to, to uh, leave those systems in place. Smog system, the smog pump, that, that's got to go, but uh, that, that's just laden with problem. Unless you're, of course, you're in California and the car's earlier than a, what, a 76? I can't, I can't remember. Um, there's a couple other states, too, that are, that are a pretty, pretty adamant about making sure that your emission control this stuff is still on there. One of them is like Idaho or Alaska, and the other one's Hawaii. It's like, doesn't all that air blow across Hawaii in a way someplace? But anyway, um, anyway, so we've got this charcoal canister, and that's the ELC system. The evaporative loss control system is the is the system. The positive. Say again. What servicing is needed for charcoal canisters, and how do you know if they're working? Um, you can service it if you wish, but unless you have the carburetor dump into it and flood it with gasoline, you don't have to do anything. If you want to be proactive about it. You can take the canister out of the car, unscrews, the original ones unscrew, no point in buying a new one. Unscrew the old one. It's got, it's got a, a screen, a mesh screen, top and bottom. And, and on one side, I think uh, the bottom side, maybe both sides, it's got some open cell foam that you can buy at the hardware store for, well, that you'd use in a window air conditioner or something. Then you take the charcoal out, put it on a cookie sheet when your wife isn't home, put it out in the sun, let it evaporate. Or if you want to be fast about it, you can hit it with a torch. It'll light, it'll light up because there's a gasoline that'll, that's adhered to the charcoal, charcoal in there. It's called the charcoal adsorption canister. <clears throat> but the charcoal will turn to ash just like it does in your Weber grill. Um, so if, if you do heat it up and light it on fire, then immediately extinguish it by throwing a rag over it and then light it again and throw a rag over it, do that four or five times, and that'll get it hot enough that all the gasoline fumes have, have burned off it. And then just put it all back in the can. That's all you have to do. You can also go to the aquarium store and buy a whole box of brand new fish charcoal, or you can take your charcoal briquettes from... <laughs> From your uh, fr from your grill and smash those up and get little little chunks and put those in there. It's just charcoal. It's called activated charcoal, but it, the only reason to activate it is because it hasn't got anything that's adhered to it. So, if the charcoal canister is plugged, then it'll end up putting a vacuum on the gasoline in the float bowls, and the car runs extremely lean or not at all. 
So that's a, that's the only fault that you have from that. You can determine quickly if the charcoal canister is of, of if there's any problem with the charcoal canister at all, simply by disconnecting the line that goes from the charcoal canister to the float bowl, whether it's the twin float bowls on the HS or the H HIF or the Stromberg carburetor, you pull that line off, it should not make one iota of difference whether the charcoal canister is connected or not. Um, if it does, then there, there's something's wrong with the charcoal canister. And it can be a thousand things, but more often than not, it's just that it's, it's plugged up somehow. Um, so you can take it apart and clean it, easy schmeasy. So anyway, that's the, the charcoal canister, I think I said earlier, it's a PCV system, it's not, it's the evaporative loss control system. The positive crankcase ventilation system is made up by the carburetors and the front tappet inspection cover that allows the fumes to be drawn out of the engine and into the carburetor and then get burned up, oxidized with all the air that's, that's available there. In 1975 and 1976, government, the federal government demanded that, that the charcoal canister be changed at I think the number is 48,000 miles. So there's a counter, there's a little like speedometer counter uh, underneath the underneath the, the heater box. And there's a speedo cable that comes up to the bottom of that. And then there's a speedo cable that runs from that to the speedo. And that that registers percentage as it rolls around. And once it gets to 100%, then the light on your console that says EGR illuminates to let you know that you're supposed to have your charcoal canister replaced at the dealer long time ago. So you can use a pair of snap ring pliers and turn that indicator back to zero anytime you want. There was a special key that some of us in the trade still have. You can put in and turn it and uh, dial it back. It's just a, just a odometer, but it's a percentage. I think it's, it runs 100% at 48,000 miles. If you wanna get rid of that counter altogether, why not? Then you buy an overdrive speedo cable. Uh, the old part number is 2738-1830. It's 1.830 meters long for an overdrive for like a 73, 74 MGB. And you can use that now and get rid of the 90 degree drive on the side of your gearbox. You can get rid of the counter and go right back into the, into the back end of your speedometer. In 1977, they introduced the transmission controlled spark advance. So this is a, a little valve up on the brake master cylinder box that is connected to the gearbox. So when you go into fourth gear, it opens. There's a vacuum line that goes from the intake manifold to that valve and from that valve to the, to the uh, vacuum advance on your distributor. So when you're in fourth gear, you get vacuum to the distributor. When you're not in fourth gear, you don't. So if you're sitting at a stoplight with your foot depressed, which you should never ever do, you should be in neutral, always idle at neutral. But if you happen to be there with your foot depressed and change from third to fourth gear, your engine speed jumps up. What is this? One time we had a guy who hooked his Washer, his washer pump through that valve. Um, God knows why. And and um, I saw that right away, and I said, "Help me out." I said, "Do your washers only work in fourth gear? Your windshield washers?" He said, "How, how do you know?" So anyway, it's 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 a best it's a that valve is best removed, um, and run the vacuum directly to the distributor. The car idles better, runs better. Uh, it doesn't pollute correctly, that's for sure, but it idles and runs better. That circuit that runs the TCSA switch, 77 through 1980, is an unfused circuit. There's a white wire that, that joins um, another white wire that comes out of the main loom and joins a white wire that goes back to run the fuel pump. And this one goes down to the gearbox. And this is at the junction of the main and rear and gearbox looms at the rear of the right front inner fender. 
where that big jumble of, of wiring is. So that's a white wire, it is, it is unfused. If you have overdrive, 77 through 80, find that wire and fuse it because that, that wire going down to the gearbox is unfused. I'm supposed to check and see I've got 149 people online. So um, where was I? Fuse that circuit, put a 10 amp fuse in that circuit so that your overdrive is fused. See, what else can I say about this? The, the air pump, if you do want to take that off, you take the air manifold out of the side of the head and you can put in Allen set screws, 7 16 20 Allen set screws. Looks nice. Don't even notice that the air manifold is gone. Around on the other side, where the air pump goes into the center of the intake manifold, the 90 degree fitting there will often come out just by grabbing it with your fingers and pulling it out. If you want to make sure that it's sealed rather than put a hose on it and a condenser in the hose and a hose clamp around that so it doesn't leak, pull that unit out, use a quarter inch NPT, national pipe thread, a quarter inch national pipe thread taper, taper pipe thread, and uh, paint the flutes of the, of the tap with grease and screw the tap in about two thirds of the way and then follow that with an Allen driven quarter inch NPT pipe plug. You'll never ever see it, it just disappears. And the whole engine looks a whole lot nicer. With all that stuff in place, some people do, some, some people who are at the shows and wanna have an original car still have that stuff. Some have cheated and taken the veins out of the inside of the air pump. Um, but the main problem is, is the, the possibility of air leaks. So you've got an additional 25 places that the air can leak um, with, that, with that pump on there. And anytime you wanna do any work with the alternator, um, that's a hassle. And the air pump does take some energy to run it. I don't know how much, some people have told me it, it, it takes a horsepower. I don't know. I'm sure it depends if it's blowing or not, or um, anyway, um, it does take energy to run. So I think that covers it. I think that's the, that's the extent of the emission control systems. Basically, there aren't any. There's a crude system up through 64. And then we've got that Smith's PCV valve from 64 through 68. That can be retrofitted uh, along with HS carburetors to any, any car 72 or later uh, using the correct manifolds and so forth. I did that on my daughter's 73 MGB GT that she took to California. Oh, I didn't mention the anti-run-on valve. So in 1973, again, to keep um, unburned hydrocarbons out of, the, out of the tailpipe, the government wants the car to shut off when you turn the key off. They don't want it to go ba-bump, ba-bump, ba-bump in diesel. When it's dieseling, it's spewing unburned hydrocarbons down the tailpipe. So they put in an anti-run-on valve that uses vacuum from the intake manifold and, and circuits that around and puts it on top of the gasoline and the float bowls and puts such a vacuum on the gasoline and the float bowls that the air going through the carburetors can't draw any air out of the float bowls. So the, the engine starves for fuel and stops instantly when it's working correctly. That's a really nice system to have. I have retrofitted that system under earlier cars, 68 and 69s, with higher compression engines that used to diesel a lot, stops the dieseling instantly. So anyway, that's, those are my comments about emission controls. I think those are my comments. So if, um, if you wanna ask some questions about the emission controls, we'll do that. And then, and then when we're done with that, we'll go back over to the chat section and I'll answer questions that, that people have on chat. So you can, if you've got a question, you can unmute yourself and, and ask about your emissions. John, are the uh, anti-run-on valves available now? No. As a matter of fact, the whole reason I did this tonight um, <laughs> is because one of our local club members asked me how to repair an old anti-run-on valve. And almost the only thing that goes wrong with an anti-run-on valve is just a simple little solenoid. 
is the little tip that comes out the side that takes the 3 16 hose that goes over to the intake manifold that snaps off. So I've been successful in taking uh, a piece of eighth inch, little tiny piece of eighth inch um, uh, like brake line. So you wouldn't use copper brake. No, it, it could be steel, it could be copper. Um, about that long and holding it in my pliers and heating it up and getting it hot and pushing it in where that tip used to come out of, letting it go, seal, and then and put some JB welder on on the outside. Looks nasty, but it works. It works. And you can blow through it um, just to make sure that, that, that it works. So that's about the only thing that goes wrong. The, the also, the other thing is the uh, electrical connections break off. Now you can peel that thing apart. It's been swedged by some fancy machine um, and you can't unswedge it very easily, but you can carefully by wrapping the solenoid with a great big piece of tubing or something or other and putting it in the vise and, and working extremely carefully. And you can finally extract the uh, plastic out of that can. But I don't know of anyone who has them or who is making them. Um, Paul Dershaw, sports car craftsman. Ian runs the place now. Um, that's a great place for used parts, but chances are they're out of, I mean, chances are they're out of them too because they are, that one little part is fragile. John? Right. Yes. So how, much, how often should you change the diaphragm on a 66 um, MGB uh, PCV valve? Only as often as necessary. So I'll carry an extra one in the in the in the glove box. Do that. Um, okay. just, just like a Stromberg carburetor, always carry an extra diaphragm in there. Sounds like a safe sex ad. Um, <laughs> it's, um, but you can't, you know, if you need one, there you you can't you can't come up with it. You can always make something out of a latex glove. You can always use a latex glove temporarily to get you through the night. You know, um, I learned that from Cecilia at Scarborough Fair. Um, she said, well, just put, a, just put a glove on it. You know, it'll hold <laughs> you for a while. And of course it will. So any, anyway, you can get out of that jam. But it, yeah, just, and you know immediately when, it's, when there's a problem because you start sp spitting uh, a lot of smoke out the back yep. end. Yeah, John? Yes. Yeah. Middle of the night, I fixed a Stromberg carburetor with a Ziploc baggie. Okay. All right. In California. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So Thank that you was David, you you. Yes. You mentioned one time that if you put your finger under the end uh, on the end of the hose coming from the anti runoff valve that the engine will shut off. Correct. So there there are there are two routes that the that, that, that uh, hose takes. Um, from 1970 through 1976, the hose just comes straight down, and and uh, it's a struggle. But you can you can get that, pull that up by the starter motor, and put your thumb on the end. But 77 through 80, it grows underneath underneath the um, the coil and comes out uh, in front by the fans. As a matter of fact, there was a, there was a specific um, a recall from British Leyland because when the fan kicked on, it would alter the, the pressure inside the charcoal canister, which would alter the pressure in the float bowl and change the way the car ran when the fan came on. So they had you pull the pull the uh, that that hose out of the radiator diaphragm and move it to the upper upper spot or something. Or other. Anyway, if you put your thumb on the end of that while the car is running. Then, then the air, then the the uh, the PCV system evacuates the engine. The engine, in turn, then is seeking air. It evacuates the charcoal canister. It, in turn, is seeking air, and it evacuates the float bowl. And within, usually within five seconds, four or five seconds, the engine will shut off. Yeah, the what? RPM usually goes up, and then it stalls. The question, my question is. Uh, if I do that, it will not shut off. If I pull the hose off the bottom of the valve and reach my finger up there and push the valve shut, it shuts off immediately. Yes, it does. But that's because you're cheating. You're using intake manifold vacuum now. 
So when you push that valve up, it does two things. It stops fresh air from coming into the charcoal canister, but it also routes manifold vacuum into the charcoal canister. And it, it just sucks it empty. Um, by doing it, by doing it with, with your thumb, you're letting the, the PCV, PCV system um, uh, pull that pull that vacuum. So, so, by, so, so just by, chase hoses. By, Start chasing hoses. There's a there's a leak. Some some of those hoses they, they get a um, you know a crack along them. Uh, sometimes they're cracked here at the side. It might be the charcoal canister won't hold a vacuum. Um, but you can you can just there's only so many hoses in this in the system, so you just go through each one and check it, and eventually you'll find the problem. Maybe on the on the Stromberg carburetor, um, one of the three screws that holds the choke in place has fallen out, so fresh air is able to go into there and go in, in the, into the charcoal canister. So uh, it can it can be some weird stuff sometimes. But almost always, it's just a broken hose. Thank you. Hey, John, one of the yeah. things I've done in the past, my car will run on. I've got a 73. And what I find is if as I'm going to turn off the ignition, I'll have the car in first gear. And as I turn off the ignition, I'll release the clutch. And oh, that yeah. stops the engine. Yeah, absolutely. Am I, doing the, am I doing the car any damage doing that? Well, well, sure. You're wearing the clutch a little bit. But what's worse? Bum, 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 or or slipping the clutch a little bit. So slipping the clutch is the least problem. But if you still have an anti-run-on valve on your car, no matter how you got, unless you got a Weber, can't hook it up to a Weber because nope. there's there's no uh, there's no port there. But um, you can you can chase that. You can chase that connection to connection, and and get that operational again. If the charcoal can't, you still got the HIF carburetors on there. I've got yeah HIF fours okay. and um, got the charcoal I, have, I do not have the run on valve though at all. Oh, all right, okay, all right. Well, then then you got to slip it. You got to slip it down. Yep. All right. Yeah, Thanks. That's what I, where that's, that's, that's what I do with my uh, my MGA. I mean, that's a sixty two and it's got pretty high compression. And uh, if, if your car is dieseling and you want it to stop dieseling. And you don't have the advantage of an anti run on valve to, to repair, um, then the only things you can do is ensure that the timing's correct 32 degrees before top dead center at full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected on every car from 1945 through 1980, except the V8s and the twin cams. Um, and then um, use the highest grade octane gasoline you can. Maybe sit and just, just let it settle just for a second before you turn it off um, and have the idle as low as you can. But if the idle is too low that you're, you're, you're killing at stop signs or something, you know, right. you, it becomes undrivable. So that's great. Yeah, right. so, yeah. So. John, what I, uh, what I usually do with mine, it tends to diesel a lot is before, as I am shutting the, uh, the ignition off, I floor the accelerator, which floods, floods the engine with, Cold, you know, presumably with cold air, and it cools. Hopefully, it cools the uh, the you know, okay. the boss in the engine. I'm not. I'm not sure that what you figured out is happening is actually happening. But but the, the the bottom line is that by putting your foot to to the floor as you turn the key off, um, it 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 doesn't run on. So that's that's the bottom line. Hey, well that's correct. Right. That's, that's interesting. I I don't, I'm not sure I've heard that before. So. Yeah, John, where is that shutoff valve located? I have an 80 MGB. Okay, that is located um, just to the side of the washer pump, um, right on the same. Uh, I think it's on the same bracket as the as the uh, washer solvent. Is it is it a is it part of the washer solvent? It's a it's a hole about that big. The valve goes in and turns. So the valve. Uh, Get out my drugs from, from the VA. The, the valve, the valve is about this big, about this, about about that big. It's a little bigger than that, but it has got a big tube off one side, three quarter inch tube off one side, and a three sixteenths tube off the other, and two wires that go to it. A slate uh, with purple and a slate with yellow. 
Oh, okay. I think I do have one on there. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work because every now and again, when I shut it off, it will keep running, but I, I do the same thing DJ does. I just leave it in gear and let the clutch out a little bit and it stops. So if, if you want to chase it and make it, if you want to chase it, make it work correctly, then, then um, find this tube that comes off the bottom of the anti-run-on valve, goes underneath the coil, through the radiator diaphragm, and just dumps out right next to the right-hand cooling fan. And while the engine's running, you put your, your thumb on that so it seals it off. And one of like three things may happen. Um, it may kill, which means that the system is working correctly um, and that there is, it's got integrity. There's no air leaks. Uh, it may be that it stumbles, you know, it, it, the, the RPMs fall and it stumbles and it runs real crappy for a little while, um, but it never really kills. And that means that it's almost working and there's a leak someplace or you put your thumb on it and, and nothing happens at all. I mean, the zero. And, and that is that there's some, some line that's, that's broken. So on a 1980, uh, follow me through that the fresh air enters that tube from underneath uh, or out in front of the radiator diaphragm, goes through the anti-run-on valve into the primary, into the first charcoal canister, out of the top of that and into the bottom of the second charcoal canister. Um, out of the bottom of that and, uh, um, excuse me, out of the top of that and, and into the engine. So there's a lot of places for air leaks. Oh, John, all right. I got some looking to do. Thank you. Steve. John, I had a question. I think it might be related to uh, emissions. I have a 68 that's stock and uh, because it's got the air pump and everything. So it's got a little wear, but when I when it idles, when I stop at a stop sign and put the put it in neutral, it idles about fourteen hundred, and then after three or four seconds, the idle just slowly drifts down to a thousand. And if I let it go down, it'll go down to like five hundred, but it'll, it's running like a John Deere at this point, you know, sort of. So I have to. So I, I assume you know I've looked. But there's sort of a list of all of the things that you know air leaks and this and that. I'm just wondering if that's well, so the first thing, the first thing you've got to decide is, do you want to keep the air pump on there? You know, you, yeah. you do or you do or you don't. If if you don't, it's easy. You probably get rid of all those problems um, just by taking the, the whole works off. But if you do want to keep it on, then you've got to find the leaks. And the easiest way to find an inlet leak that may be causing part of this problem is to spray between and around anything that might ventilate into the intake manifold with some kind of spray carburetor carbur cleaner. The, the better, the, the hotter the, the, the stuff, the better. Or ether, ether works well too. If you can get a tube on the end of it um, so you know where it's, it's pointed. And you're gonna go between the head and the manifold, the manifold and the heat shield, the heat shield and the spacer blocks, spacer blocks and the carburetors all around the carburetor shafts all around the 90 degree fitting and the intake manifold over the gulp valve and the gulp valve over to the air pump. Um, that's, I guess that uh, 68, that's about it. But the reason that it, it's, it's coming down, 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 down is probably because it's idle, it's too rich. This is just a guess. I, I, think, I just think it's too rich. The idle has been cranked up to, to overcome that richness. In 1968 and Maybe through 71, there were these little brackets put on the bottom of the carburetor so you could turn the adjuster nut only like two flats. Uh, the government didn't trust you to adjust your, your car, so they put these, these locks on it so you couldn't turn it too much. Um, a pair of pliers rips those right off. Um, and then, you, then you've got full, full, uh, full turning. If you want to keep those there, They've got a little lock tab on them and you really got to get a mirror and see what's going on and bend that lock tab out of the way. And then you're free to turn them to lean, turn it up into the into the carburetor and lean out the mixture. But it's probably because it's running too rich, but you got such a such a chance of vacuum leaks there. That's that's what you want to look for first. But of course the vacuum leak means mm -hmm. that point it's running too lean, right? When it's when it's sucking an extra air in. Yep, yep, but, but some vacuum leaks change. 
some vacuum okay. exchange. I mean, some hoses leak and then the higher the vacuum, they draw it together and they leak less. So, I mean, there's just lots of possibilities here. Okay, so one, one more point. So the, the throttle shaft, I can move it a little bit. There's a little bit of play. Yeah, that's a lot, of, a lot of them do that, but that, as long as they're both the same, that, that's, that's not the source of your problem. Oh, really? Okay. No. No, lots, because lots. Of, I heard that people have, you know, without going to the trouble of having the carburetor body bored out and putting bushings, that if you just get a new shaft, it'll tighten up that clearance a little bit and might fix things. But if that's not the problem, I'll try someplace else first, I guess. I, I, I would, I would look, I would look for the, um, yeah, I'd look for the, okay. for the vacuum leaks. And um, I'd also make sure the timing's correct because you have no, I mean, timing is critical. Well, it is only getting, it's, it was idle for quite a while. It is only getting about 16 miles per gallon. So it probably is a little rich. <laughs> probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, hey, well, thanks, gonna, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. Nominally, you should expect to get like 25 miles per gallon. Yeah, I used I to, but yeah. What's uh, Bob and Gloria, well, what do you get when you're out on your 100,000 mile jaunts? Well, so it, it varies. I've gotten as low as... Uh, like 22 and generally average about 26, 27. Okay. And I've got the, the 60 thousands overboard in the larger valves, but the overdrive helps. Yeah, okay. I just, I just, I, I was, I was telling people 25 miles per gallon, which yeah. is the same, same as my late wife's um, 1998 Toyota Sienna got until, until the day I sold it. So, yeah, about 25. Do I, have, do I have some more questions about emission controls? Yes, John? Yes. Um, I'm in, I just purchased a, uh, I got a great deal on a MGB last week. Great news, I'm in California, so was the car. So body's very clean. Bad news, it's a 78. So it has to pass emissions out here. And I know you have a couple other California viewers. I was wondering, in as stock, what my chances are of getting it to uh, pass. And secondly, the guy threw in a Weber manifold and carburetor, and I'm assuming I probably won't get that to pass. But I think I'm. I don't live in California, but I hear a lot about it. I think everything has to be in place. Um, I don't think technically. I know it does. I mean, okay. All right. Okay. It so should, and people go all the way, you know, they, their brother-in-law is in Reno, so they, they register in Reno and they, they escape all that. But David Knock, are you still on? Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, the <laughs> biggest, <laughs> so, so the problems start all over the place, but um, I found if the biggest thing that helps, if it's a borderline, if it everything is there, and functioning um if there is anywhere in the orifice on the stromberg carburetor it will not pass so you got to have a needle and orifice that have zero wear um adjust the valves to about 16 thousandths and get some more little bit more duration out of it helps a lot um I open them up 16, maybe 18 thousandths. They may clap. Oh, wow. Okay. Bit. Will help a lot. Um, is the catalyst a good? Um, I just got to it because I pulled the head over the weekend. And uh, all mm -hmm. I did so far was shake it. I don't know how else to. Okay. Take a little small hammer and tap on the catalytic converter. Yeah. If it sounds like an uh, empty butt barrel. You're, you're done okay um it will not pass if the compressions are low or if you have anything that's excessive leak down in the cylinders it will not pass oh leak down okay um you got yeah, i'm trying to decide down. if i need rings or not and uh... yeah um if i'm doing any car here if it's got any leak down at all I won't even fight the smog because it's going to need need rings and it needs it's going to need a rebuild. Um, it has to be 
absolutely like like new. Otherwise, it will not pass. Okay, I I deeply appreciate it, especially as as now. As where I'm are you in Cal Where are you in California? Well, the car's up in Lake Arrowhead, so that's where. Okay, I'm. there is counties. I know you just bought it, so it doesn't matter. There is counties in California that don't do smog test. So like up in Sacramento area, you go up into the foothills, they don't do the biannual smog checks. <clears throat> and I've had guys get a PO box up there and register their cars up there and bypass it. But if you don't have that available, it everything has to be working a hundred percent all right don't try i'm in the project management stage so i'll just plan on pulling the engine and doing the rings and yeah um you don't you don't have to pull the engine to do the rings you can well do, okay I'll, yeah you can You're do right. them in I don't place. Have to. Yeah. you can you can do them in place i can borrow someone's little fingers right yeah but but as so, long as you're there you might as well check the cam too um, yep. To make make sure the cam is all right, it'll put a dial dial indicator on the on the on the push rod, and just roll the engine around, you know, seven twenty on on each each one of those, and and the lift that you should find is 0.265. You write that number down, 0.265. So if if you're off a couple thousands here and there, that's not going to make any difference at all. But if you're off Thirty thousandths or something. Or the the if the cam's gonna yeah, gonna yeah. die pretty soon anyway. You still don't have to take the engine out. You can take the the front cover off, and you can take the distributor drive gear out, and you can change the cam in place. Okay. And the other thing is, if it's been sitting a lot and short drives out here, the air tubes in the air rail will plug up with carbon. And it doesn't matter how good your air pump is working, it's not pushing any air into the uh, exhaust, which is what, and without air getting into the exhaust, the catalyst will not start to work. Okay. <laughs> so you, you can clean those out with what, like an eighth inch drill bit or something? Yeah, you need like an eight inch long, six eighth inch drill bit. And <clears throat> you just have to be real careful that you don't go too far. <laughs> And the CalCats are all universal though, right? I can't get a bolt in into the- uh... There is not a bolt in cat available. Um, and any cat in California has to be certified for that car for that year. Um, and they're almost impossible to find. Okay. And almost as expensive as what I paid for the car. Uh, <laughs> Is there, well, is there I haven't found a good I found one yet that is California legal. Okay. That there's just not enough of them required. Magnaflow claims there's this California. Well, they do claim one, but you, it it fits it fits up underneath the car rather than on the manifold. Right. Okay. Um, and then you run into other issues, but it can be done. All right. Well, I appreciate all your, sure, your time. Make sure it is a California certified cat. Okay. Appreciate that it. Sounds, sounds like it might be easier to move to a different state. Oh, well, I think happens. I'll just fix it up and sell it to someone out of state or in Europe. I think that's probably, and then yeah. buy from the I get I get people coming in, they've had Weber conversions and everything, and they pick the car up off of eBay, and it's like, don't even bother. You know, yep. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll just sell it to europe and help and then also to... take a close look at the intake manifold between the number one exhaust port and the number two intake and look at the angle of the the, the exhaust pipe and what happened was because the cat got hot it warped the end of the in exhaust manifold and causes a vacuum leak and misalignment of the intake manifold. Oh God, okay. So look at the clearance at the top of the, right between the two and compare it to the rear one between four and three. And if it's closed up, the manifold's no good. Gotcha, thank you. Okay.
in the state of Michigan, it used to be used to be that you know if you if you came with bills and you'd already spent pick a number three hundred dollars, and the car still wasn't um, meeting emissions, then you were exempt because you'd spent enough money on it, and poor people couldn't afford to have their cars fixed up. So, but I guess that that's we we don't have emission stuff here now. Um, most states don't. So California, I know California does, I think maybe Idaho does, maybe Alaska and or Hawaii does. And there might, there might be, the, the closer you get to Washington, D.C., um, the more if, um, control the federal government seems to exert. Yeah, Delaware, um, Delaware is really a snot about it. Okay. But for most of us, it is an initial, and, and when does it come up, David, out in, in California? David stepped away from the from the thing. I think it's 76 in newer. You have 76 in newer. Yeah. And, okay. um, and they were trying to get a new uh, legislation pushed through for a parade car, you know, an antique car. Yeah, sure. It's not, there's, there have been more important things to deal with, I guess, at the legislature than that. So yeah. for a while, it was 30, going to be 30 years and older, but the gubernator, Arnold, signed it in. That's 76, and it stayed there. So it's hard on a lot of enthusiasts out here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, do I have any more questions about emissions? I've got one over in the chat section, John, but I'll oh, wait. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go over to chat right now. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Steve. I've got a 79 MGB, and uh, I like to remove the Zenith Stromberg. Remove, uh, all right, the air pump's already been removed. The air rail's been removed. The catalytic converter's been removed. And I like to put some... Uh, SU HIV carbs in there. Okay, so I'm sorry. So, so my suggestion here is to is to get a, a a matching set of inlet and exhaust manifolds, factory manifolds. I've got don't, that. Don't don't use a header. Um, all headers leak. All headers are noisy. Um, all headers are hot. All headers are headaches. I don't like headers. Um, and and uh, th that factory uh, factory exhaust manifold, then buy a front factory pipe, and that'll bolt on between the manifold and your ex existing exhaust system. All you need is the front pipe. Buy the you know get you got the the matching the uh, um, inlet and exhaust manifolds in that the thickness of the ears that attach it to the to the head are the same thickness, either seven sixteenths for the HIFs or or uh, nine sixteenths for the earlier cars. And I've then, got I've got all I got all three of those, so I'm ready to go on that. Okay, all right. Uh, my biggest concern is uh, the routing of the, uh, uh, I guess from the valve cover vent, it goes to the charcoal. Leave that. Le leave that just, like that. that. You, just like that. You're going to leave it just like that. Just okay, like that. Go to the run on valve and from the run on valve do I to, go the, to the intake manifold. To the intake manifold. From the, fr from the front tappet inspection cover to the 12G2193 plastic Y piece to the front, gotcha. of the front and the rear and the rear of the carburetor. I've got that. And from, from um, the vent on the front, front carburetor to the full bowl vent on the rear carburetor and over to the charcoal canister. Now that's, that's kind of dicey because you can't have a low point in the line. In the line going from the the uh, bolt bowls to the charcoal canister, the 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 endpoints that have to be the lowest. You can't have a, a low point, a low sag in the middle. Um, that's why the Stromberg used that that pipe that goes across the back of the valve cover, um, so that nothing could sag because if the carburetors, no, when the carburetors overflow, you'll get you'll get um, gasoline trapped in a low spot and the car will not run correctly until you finally found, find that that's the problem. 
and blow it out or something or other, and then, then it'll happen again. So you want to make sure that the low point in the hoses that go from the float bowls to the charcoal canisters are the charcoal canister and the float bowls. Those are the two lowest points. You say from the what? Flood and catch up float bowl? Well, from the, from the charcoal canister to the float bowl. But you just, oh, float bowl. Okay, you, can't, you just can't have a sag in it. The earlier cars had a line that ran across the back of the, uh, the firewall, right underneath the bonnet hinges, or right between the bonnet hinges, and, um, and connected to the charcoal canister, and then, and then connected uh, to the, to the uh, carburetors. And that worked out very well. So just just have you just can't have a low point in the line. That's all. Okay, so I will not need the uh, PCV valve at all then on those things. There's there's no PCV valve because your carburetors are ventilated. There's that okay. 45 degree brass tube that comes up between the air piston and the throttle disc. All right. So do I keep the uh, do I need to vent my gas tank or not? It is already vented to the charcoal canister. So I'm good on that then. Your, your, your evaporative loss control system is good the way it sits, yes. Okay. And that should get me going then, shouldn't it? Yes, sir. And if you want, you can, you can contact me you know, tomorrow another time, take a couple pictures of the car and show me what you're doing. And, and I'll tell you whether you got the lines hooked up right or not. And just block the uh, port for the belt valve on the manifold. And you want to, you, you're going to, you're going to get the, the plug for that, right? Right. I'm going to plug up the uh, port right. for the yes. valve. Yes, correct. 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 Okay. And you that. also, also, as long as you have the opportunity, you're either going to replace the throttle discs. Oh, what year are the carburetors from? Do you know? 74, I think. 70 what? I think it's 74. Okay. All right. So you can replace the throttle discs uh, with solid throttle discs if you want to spend 35 bucks or something like that per disc, or you can simply solder the overrun valves shut um, by taking your pro propane torch and, and heating it from the button side and putting some flux and solder in on the spring side and, and getting, that, getting those valves soldered shut so they will not open on deceleration. Okay. So and then I've got examples at my shop. I'll be there tomorrow. You can call me or something. I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, what's your number at the shop? I'm sorry. Oh, this um, is probably on here someplace, but uh, my, my phone number is 616-307-6737. All right. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to move over to the chat section. So the chat John, section. Yes. One more question about emissions. Yes. When I go to Nampa to buy tubing to replace all my nasty old cracked emissions tubing, Fuel what on. kind do I ask for that's flexible enough to get into all those weird <laughs> shapes that it has um, to be? Usually, usually just a Gates green fuel line and then even the, for the really big ones they make fuel line that's well, you can ask and see but it, 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 it you, you don't want you don't want orange heater tubing but we right. used we used a lot of half inch heater hose for for that stuff it just uh, there's not enough vapor that goes through there that that degrades that and for the little tiny areas where, where you've got a, you know, you've got a, a hose that seemingly the size of a pencil, you got to take it through a real tight 90. If you put a spring, push a spring, a long spring up inside that hose and bend it, the hose will not, cannot collapse. So uh, things like, um, Things like the, the heater, the heater hose that comes off the back of the, comes off the heater valve and goes to the, the inlet on the heater box on the right side of the engine above the distributor. Um, okay. That one or, or the other one, we, we just take, we take a screen door spring and uh, pull it. And by pulling it, it, the diameter reduces, put a little grease on it, shove it down inside the, that hose. You can, you can wrap that into a pretzel. And it'll never collapse.
Now I'm going to try with the chat section. So Marty and I today went to the um, Hilton Hotel. We got a we got a price of 112.50. That sounds good, but of course it's um, plus plus, and I think it ends up being. I think we calculated it's about 130 bucks a night. Um, that's the 18th and 19th of August. If you want to come to the University Motors Summer Party Reunion, we don't know how much it's going to cost yet to put your car out on the field, but eh, it's going to be around 40. But we think it's going to be around 40 bucks. And then if you want to buy a, a lunch, we cannot have a food vendor at the at the at the park. Used to have one, but I'm no longer grandfathered in because it's been too long since I've had a a um, an event there. So um, we have to have prepaid lunches. Um, so that there there will be lunches and soft drinks there. Anyway, that's that's the that's the plan so far. But I don't have a code yet for the hotel. As soon as I get a code. Um, so that you can call and make a reservation or do it online and enter a code, then um, I'll have that out probably Wednesday, and I'll send out another uh, constant contact uh, note about the summer University Motors summer party reunion. So how many summer parties is that? Well, we quit on the 19th annual, and then we had some revivals and reunions after that, up to about 2016, sporadically. Um, so I can't, I don't know exactly, but we're pushing probably uh, solid 25, if not 30 summer parties. So those of you who've been there and remember the summer parties, this is not gonna be one of those, but can't do it. Um, we used to have, I mean, at the, at the peak, at the peak, we had 550 MGs on the field. We had buses taking the women to the shopping malls over in Holland. We had the, the inflatable kitty stuff, you know, the bouncy the bouncy rooms and stuff for, for uh, kids and grandkids. And uh, we had coloring contests for kids. And we had uh, um, craft contests and, and, and the fo photo fo photograph contests, parts contests, and vendors. And, oh my gosh. Big time, 550 cars on the field, another 50 in the parking lot, too cheap to, to, uh, to pay their, their due and, and come out and sit with everybody else. Um, and uh, the hotel was filled, big parking lot party, good times, good times. So those of us who were there and still wanna see each other um, because the, the two national meets this year are in Memphis and Calgary, so there's nothing in the upper Midwest. Uh, um, so if you want to participate in an MG party, just have a good time, just a weekend. There's there's no, so far, I don't, nobody, I swear no one's going to talk me into this. There's going to be no contests. I mean, there's no ribbons, there's no trophies. Um, we're, we're parking pretty randomly. One of our parties, we parked by color. Uh, we didn't park by model, but we parked by color. But when we were parking by model, we had to we had to take the 77 through 80 MGBs and break them into two sections. And and the only difference between a, a, a 78 and a 79 is the number of throttle return springs. I mean the cars are identical, but there were just too many. There were 40 or 50 in the class, so we had to we had to break the class apart uh, in, into um, anyway. Uh, those, those those were the heady days. This I'll, I'll be happy to have a small summer party at summer party reunion. So all of us can sit around and polish our cars and see what we've done to our cars and talk to each other and just have a good time. Anyway, that information is coming. That was Marty's first part, the first uh, mentioned here on the chat. Let me see if I can get this to work. Here we go. Okay, from Judd. My TD no longer has the original air cleaner. Um, uh, the air, air manifold for the oil bath filter, their previous owner installed pancake filters. Oh my gosh. And just plugged the valve cover breather pipe. I unplugged it and added the, um, the, the filter shown. Uh, TFs have a breather hose going to one of the pancake filters in back. Can I do that? Yes. Um, does the hose need a restriction? Other, uh, are, are there other issues? You'll have to just see if the hose needs a restriction. A TF, a TF does have a restriction on the back of the air filter. 
so it, it can only pull in just a, a little bit of air. You'll find out quickly enough, one of the secrets is to reduce the amount of oil that's up on the top of the engine by putting a, a restrictor in that external oil line that goes from the block up to the head. We used to use Holley uh, carburetor jets, maybe a 50,000 jet or something, and that would grossly reduce the amount of oil getting up to the head. That in turn then would reduce the amount of oil that would be splashing into the air cleaner. Those pancake filters look cool, they're really neat, but if you take them apart, you know, that foam is only about that thick and it's only about that long wrapped around. Um, so, it, it, and it's, I mean, it's just tiny. So it can't either, either it can't remove the particulates that the air cleaner did or, or um, you have to clean them all the time. So well, you, mine aren't even that good. Uh, mine just have uh, uh, what looks like maybe brass mesh. Oh, I see that. Probably stop large gravel and small birds. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, you can, so put oil, you can put oil on that. And then um, you don't want to use steel wool because that's too fine. That'll get sucked down through the carburetor. But you can use some other stuff called Shore Boy, C-H-O-R-E. It's like real thick steel wool. And you can, you, they come in little tufts. They're yep. cleaning pots and pans. Um, you can, you can uh, take that apart kind of and stretch it out and put that in there and just put oil on it every now and then. And that'll okay. help. Well, I've so, thought about that. I've thought about uh, just for the coolness uh, factor, getting those ram tubes and sticking steel wool in the ram tubes. I think it'd be horrible. But it, anyway, I don't know if you can see the picture of me. Or yeah, not. I, that's yeah. what I've got currently with no, that. Um, that's fine. Is there anything wrong with that? There's, there's nothing wrong with that. It, it, uh, it, it could be better um, by, by, you know, by going right to the, uh, right to the air, air cleaner, but um, that's it, just fine. It's just fine the, the, the way it is. It doesn't hurt anything. As long as you're not spitting the oil out on top of the engine and the top of the engine doesn't look especially oily. It's so, not. No, that's just fine then. That, that'll work. Well, then on the, if it, runs it's done it may stay that way <laughs> yep that's right if it what what did the president say if it isn't broken don't fix it if it ain't broke don't fix it yep uh, right so. all right so here we go ot renkin asks me what is needed to convert from wire wheel to disc wheels on my 1970 and my 1987 he probably means 1978 mgb so you want to convert from wire wheels to row style wheels on your B. Yes, John, before you get started on that, uh, I've been chatting with uh, another gentleman online here, Pat, and uh, he, he made a suggestion or an idea about using mini light wheels uh, that are splined that will fit onto the MGB wire wheel rotor. I'm, I mean, hub. Correct. Those are available. And Is there a particular, a particular year that I should be looking for? No, they're in the MGB wheel will, will be the same. Uh, they're all they're all 14 inch, and of course it has to do with the offset. You know where the wheel runs in relation to the to the hub in the middle, but that's no. already that's already pre predetermined. By I the, meant the I meant the mini light wheel. Is that uh, mini light? Is a, it was a trade name. I'm not sure that any, any wheels still are actually mini light, but it's like saying Kleenex. You know, um, when in fact you want Scott tissues, but everybody calls it Kleenex. So they call them mini lights, but they're alloy wheels. They're alloy spoke wheels. You can go in the Moss catalog. I'm sure they're right there. Okay. But if you want to convert, if you want to convert to disc wheels, you got to change. You got to change the the front hubs. That's easy. Front hubs ought to be. You ought to be able to buy a pair of used ones for fifty bucks. I mean, there there's a million of them out there. Okay, on the rear axle, on the rear axle, you've either you've got to do one of two things. You've either got to change the entire rear axle to a disc wheel rear axle, or pull the hubs off. Put three-quarter-inch longer studs in there. Get get um, discs 
three quarter inch thick discs that you put on over those studs and then put your row styles in. So to push the wheels out, because if you put row styles on the on the um, on the beam on the wire wheel rear axle, they're they're too they're set too far inboard and you get interference with a with a body. How about the rear axle hubs? No. Are they, I don't, are they still available or is there, are they is that the, something you can find the, on the rear axle hubs? Oh, yeah. again, you should be able to get a pair. Of, I mean, I mean, you should be able to get a pair of them for almost free. I mean, everybody's got them lying around. And they never go bad, um, you know. And you got to get it. You got to get um, the drums are the same. So all all you need is the hubs. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, sports car craftsman is a really nice place to uh, to buy used parts out of Arvada, Colorado. There's also what's the oh, so who's the guy in uh, Alabama? Who's the guy in Alabama's got parts? Um, Matthews, Matthews, foreign car, something like that. And then um, Bob and Glory, what's your place? Tri on, um, Team, Team Triumph in Warren, Team, Ohio. Team Triumph in Warren, Ohio. So you ought to be able to get all four hubs from somebody for a hundred bucks. I mean, he's got hundreds of them. <laughs> so he <laughs> can't get rid of them. But he's got he's got to find them and clean them up and put them in a box and send them to you. What was that last one? Team Triumph. Team Triumph. Yeah, he, has, he has a website, and uh, most of his business is mail order. And he's a Moss distributor too, which you know gives you a, a discount on the Moss prices. Okay. But he's got a a building and a half just filled with used parts. John. Okay. My my B has 15 inch wires and all the row styles are 14 inch wheels. I don't know whether Ott has the same issue. Uh, does that create a problem? Other than the fact that you got to buy all new tires? Um, well, on a B, on a B, the wires and, and the discs are both 14. Mm. Originally, originally. I'll check again, but I think mine are 15, but I'll look again. You may have mine, mine, four, mine are 14. Yeah. Yeah. Leave it to me to have an oddball. So well that that's it, you know, it, by the time you get to 16 inch wheels on an MGB, you start to run into into real some real problems. It looks cool, but it's real hard to steer. But 15 inch are are, are common. I mean, I've I've seen them. MGC uses 15 inch. You know, it looks the same. It's the same car. So, well, excuse me for insulting MGC owners, but um, I mean, it, a lot of this stuff. A lot of this stuff's the same. How's that? How's that? Okay, David, having an issue with dragging overheating front brakes. I recently adjusted the brake switch. Could that be causing the brakes to drag? David, are you still online and you've been waiting patiently to have me answer your question? Yes, I am, John. Okay, and yes, that is exactly a, What year and model do you have? It's an 80, and um, I converted to LED lights uh, throughout the car, and I, I determined that the brake lights weren't working. And I subsequently found a, a wire, a disconnected wire, but I had repositioned the brake switch and uh, before I found this broken wire. And I didn't realize that maybe the tolerance of when you readjust that brake switch could be a problem for the valve that's in part of the master cylinder. So take your, take your two, two fingers and reach down into the wheel well and feel, feel the free play on the clutch and the clutch will move that far, tunk, 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 tunk. And it moves farther than it should because it's worn. Now feel the break. There's no free play because you've got the switch turned in too far. Okay. You should have at least half an inch of free play. So what you're doing, sort of, is driving around with your foot on the brake. Yeah. So, so then the brakes start to heat up. The brake fluid expands. The pressure goes up. The brakes come on even harder. <laughs> and it's a it's a cyclical thing until your your car is stopped 
dead by the side of the road until it all cools down. So, yeah. And the smell of the burning brakes, too. Yes. Was a giveaway. Yeah. But I never thought it would be something simple like the brake switch, the brake light switch, but out of position. I mean, my goodness. I, well, but you know, it's it's um, but it is, <laughs> but it is. You know, the earlier the earlier switches are pressure switches, um, and then they went to a mechanical switch. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, maybe a safety feature. Maybe um, I, I know I I had someone with an earlier car, uh, like an MG or earlier MGB or an MGA, put a put a, a switch on their car because they said they didn't want to wait until they got brake pressure for the brake lights to come on. They wanted the brake lights to come on like right as soon as I touch that pedal, I want the brake lights to come on, so. Thank you. Okie doke. Um, John. Yes. Did I get the name of that uh, used parts dealer that uh, Bob and Glory you were talking about in Ohio? Team Trump. Tri Team Triumph. Team Triumph. Thing. I want. I was going to Triumph Rescue, and I thought, no, they're in Philadelphia. So it's it's Scott Triumph. Harper is his name. Scott Harper at Team Triumph. What's the okay. city again? Warren, Ohio. Warren, Ohio. Yeah, it's Warren, near Ohio. Youngstown. Okay. There is also a guy up in New York, uh, British Auto. Uh, all he he has a pretty good sized salvage yard, and all he sells is British parts. There's also a Tom at British Miles in uh, New Jersey, maybe. Uh, where's Where's Tom? I think it's Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. All right. Pennsylvania. Tom. He, matter of fact, he he bought up all the Tom Clark stuff. Um, so um, yeah, there's a lot. There, my go-to place is is the place in Colorado because you call them and the stuff will be in a box and in the mail to you the day or the day after the day you called or the day after you called. Um, other I, I've had experiences with other places that they have the stuff and then you call them a week later and it's like, oh, my dog got sick or I couldn't find a box or I, it, it just like, okay, dude, but you know, come on, <laughs> I need my part. Um, and uh, Sports Car Craftsman has always been instant in sending it out. Maybe some of these places, other places are too, so. Yeah, that's the way the guy, British Auto, uh, I called and ordered something and he yeah. had it out the next day to yeah, me. So he, hey. he was really good. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay, okay from Dave Smittle, 53 TD. I have no headlamps nor dashboard lights. The side lamps, all four work fine, just tailgated someone else to get back to the hotel for the Ohio chapter meet last week, but haven't had the time to diagnose. Where's the best place to start? I have no headlamps nor dashboard lights, but the side lights all work. That's, that's yeah, that's really interesting. So um, let's go for the dashboard lights first. Um, Dave, are you still on? Hi, John. Hey, great, thanks. Um, the back of that switch, the back of that switch in the in the dash, um, you've got a you've got a heavy wire um, uh, brown with blue, I think, that comes in to A um, at the top at the top, and then there's a, a white wire that comes off up there, IGN for ignition from your ignition switch. Then down at the bottom are uh, are L. That's your headlights, L. And you've also got a one there marked T for tail lights. And there's about five wires that are supposed to be stuffed up, up underneath that um, to the um, tail lights. And what I found is easier to handle is to get an inline fuse with, with uh, tails on it and take one the inline fuse put a 10 amp fuse in it and put that underneath the T in the switch and then junction all the rest of those wires through a big buck connector on the other end of that, of that um, inline fuse. That way you've got it fused and all 
all those like five wires will fit in there. But that's, that's, I think, the first place I'd start. And then you got two different problems. They may have the same problem. Uh, they may not. Uh, I don't know how they would have uh, the same source. I, don't, I, don't, I can't make it work in my head. But, um, but anyway, you need not a meter. Throw away that meter. <laughs> you need a 12-volt test light, the cheapest test light you can get from Napa. First thing you do with a test light is test it. And um, so you're going to get underneath there and touch it. You know, if you can, if you can crawl underneath your dash, um, touch it up, up to, up to that uh, top, top wire, that A wire. Test your test light. It lights up. Okay. Well, now with the headlamps on, the L should be, should be hot. From there, it's a blue wire and goes to the dipper switch. Is the dipper switch on the horn or is it on the floor? It's on the floor. Okay. So you get a blue wire that goes from the from the headlamp switch down to the dipper switch. Um, I mean, it could be. I mean, it could be all kinds of things. You could have lost both grounds at the same time. How is that even possible? Um, yeah. you know, on the on the on the headlamps, um, uh, it could be the the dipper switch is faulty. Uh, one one of the wires fell off the dipper switch. One of the wire fell off the back of the headlamp switch. Lots of possibilities. Best way is to start at one end or the other and just work work uh, towards towards the other end, whichever end you start with. And that would make for me, I'd start at the headlamp switch. Okay. Cool. And on, on that on that on the dash lights, there's a red wire that comes out of the out of the T for tail. And that and that goes over to the to the switch on the on the dash where it turns into into red with white. So that's the switched side of that circuit is the red with white. So it goes from Tail, uh, the tail lamp fitting to the dash switch in red, and away from the dash switch in red with white. But if, of course, you've got original wiring colors, you can't tell the original wires in there. You can't begin to tell what color they used to be. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, Marty. Here's a direct PayPal link for. Well, it's probably um, uh, donate. That's that's for me. Thank you. And here's our new website. Here's the information about the Champagne British Car Festival. And here we got John Mine. Hey, I went John. from 1977 to a 1980, and the charcoal filters went from one to two. Uh, adsorption canisters. Yes, that that is correct. So in 1979, the federal government wasn't satisfied with the, with the number of, of charcoal canisters. The ability of the charcoal canister to hold all the fumes that might be coming off the gas tank or off the carburetor, and they, they uh, demanded that the volume be greater. Rather than make the single charcoal canister larger, they just put in two. That's all. All right. Uh, John Bruce McMillan. Yes. 79 body, 67 engine. Any reason you really need to to make the car work? You don't. You don't need the. You don't need the canister. No. No, just knocking down from one to two, or from two to one. Oh no, just one. One's just fine. You got it, and thank you for your help. Hey, you're very welcome. So yeah, use a, use what, what this is 66 engine, 67 engine powertrain. Uh, 67 uh, high compression GB, 79 body. Okay. HF right. carbs. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, you'll be you'll be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Tony Wisely, has anyone had any issues with a digital speedometer intact featured on the Moss catalog as a replacement to the Smith stack in Speedo? How do they detect your speed? Can't figure out. I yeah, save me. I can't. I can't figure it out. The GPS, I expect, but I don't know. I I, I don't. I don't know these uh, uh, these tack and speedos. Is, is it anybody purchased one of these um, digital tack or speedos from Moss and installed it? And do you know how it works? I don't. I didn't even know they had them. Silence. 
Silence. Well, we'll have to wait till next week and we'll ask, ask the same question. Um, let's see. Uh, re, re, yeah, Robert Davidson, that's it. Robert, are you on tonight? Yeah. Okay. So that, that is that is the reason that I'm talking about emissions tonight is because you asked me about how to re, refurbish that valve. So if you energize, energize the valve, you can hear it click. It's just a solenoid. Um, but almost always the only thing that happens is that that, that tube, that little that quarter inch tube, three sixteenths tube, plastic tube snaps off. And uh, there's got to be a way. Somebody, uh, somebody's got a, a, a way to, to do that. Yeah, I mean, no, me, mine's I fine. I, I I was just kind of curious because every time you look at uh, in the catalogs, they say not available, and I thought, man, you know how many of these are actually out there? But my, I guess a question I have is, uh, my car's a '77, and I have early HS4 carburetors on it, uh, pre-68. So they don't have a fitting for that. So I need to be able to run something to the intake manifold, but what, what size fitting am I looking at so I can put that vacuum on the top of the float bowls? Oh, okay. So, um... You're going to come out of the front tappet inspection cover with a half inch hose, and you're going to right. come up to a Smith's PCV valve. That Smith's PCV valve, which you can buy from Moss, brand new, um, is is um, um, has got a uh, about a half inch pipe that comes off the bottom of it. So you're going to tap your manifold if it's not already tapped, quarter inch NPT, which is about half an inch OD. Say that again. You're going to tap your manifold one quarter inch NPT national pipe thread. And then you're going to install a pipe nipple in there. And then you're going to take a piece of half inch hose and put it on the, on the PCV valve and slip it over, over the nipple. Maybe use two hose clamps on it. And then to keep the whole thing from wiggling, uh, you, can use a, uh, you can use a strap. You can stop by. I'll be there shop tomorrow. Uh, you can stop by. I'll, I'll show you what what to do. Um, um, there's a an original strap you can get, or you can get the the. I like that strap that you use on the front of a uh, muffler. It's a real thick metal strap, uh, and you, you you can bend it and fold it and and hook it onto the valve, and and the and the and that'll keep the valve from wiggling back and forth and fatiguing that that uh, that hose. In this way, now your anti-run-on valve will work because you're you're uh, you've got vacuum uh, available, and your car will have a positive crankcase ventilation system on it. The only thing we have to deal with is are the needles that are in your car correct for that PCV valve? So when they went from um, 1967 PC, um, just a minute. When they went from the HS carburetor with an MB needle and then put on the Smith's PCV valve, they went to a number five needle. Um, but we can take a look at your carburetors and just see what, what, what the scoop is. It's really easy to, to do. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, and and by the way, what, what kind of coffee do you like since you're only like three minutes away? Hot. Hot, uh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. I, I drink iced coffee. I drink cold coffee too. So anyway, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah for everybody who's, yeah, I, it, I'm, I'm the one responsible and I got John like three minutes from my house. So <laughs> who's luckier than me? Well, except that I don't do any work. I mean, I, I don't officially do any work. I've got, I've got um, a couple projects in my shop right now. Uh, car that I'm even embarrassed to say how long it's been in the shop and then another car that's been there for the better part of two years so you know the other car's been there longer um so anyway I'm, and I'm trying to get this stuff done before I do anything else but if you're coming and I can show you what to do I can point out some parts you, you can do it there or go back home you know okay yeah I got one I got one other thing to get the car running before I can bring it over there so okay. stupid idiot 
uh, valve, uh, not a uh, gasket thing. I've got tons of exhaust coming in. The, uh, the gasket between the uh, cylinder head and uh, exhaust manifold has failed. And I got just like boatloads of exhaust coming into the. Oh engine. yeah, so yeah. I got to do that first before okay. I, you know before I kill myself. Okay. See you later, John. Hey, thanks. Next one up here, we got Bill. Bill from Bill's iPad. My 1976 MGB is always idle high when warm, 12 to 1500. I've never been able to get it down. I have HIF carburetors. Any advice? Bill, are you still on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so yeah. have the HIF carburetors been rebuilt? Um, not since I've had it, but they, they seem to be in good shape. Oh, oh, excuse me. Yes, I have rebuilt them. I changed uh, about two years ago. I changed all the all the seals and and everything. Yeah, change the needles, change the floats. Uh, oh, no, is, I didn't change the floats. I apologize. It is possible. Um, to install the the bushings in yes. the HIF carburetors, the throttle shaft bushings incorrectly, that okay. allows air to get around the edge of the throttle shaft. Okay. So that's a bizarre one, but let's just go through the. Well, I didn't. I didn't change those. I just changed with the kit. You know the. And is this new? Is this idling? Is this high idle new? It, it seems like I've, since I've got it, I, I I know my way around the carburetors fairly well, and and I just and I I just the car runs well, but it it just but idles. It is, that's way too pay. Yeah, that's embarrassing at a stop sign. Yeah. So um the the things that you would take a look at would be number one the throttle cable where it comes down to the interconnecting link. Okay. Two carburetors, and you got the fingers, right? Yeah. You got to make sure that you got free play both fore and aft on the on the uh, throttle, the interconnecting link. Okay. And you can turn it a little bit, a little bit, okay. a couple degrees, five degrees, ten degrees, something or other before something starts to happen, so okay. that you're sure that that both the um that that's not holding the 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 throttle open. Okay. Um, you got the throttle screws on, on both uh, both throttle screws, the, yeah. the regular throttle and the and the fast idle. You got to make sure that those aren't down on the on the cams. You got HIF carburetors, right? Yeah. Okay. The the the, uh, the throttle one screws are almost backed off completely. Okay. Well, the, there's the other screws that go on the, on the cam. For the yeah. fast idle, and you get but the fast the fast idle screws when the, when the car is is not when the the choke isn't pulled out or the fast idle isn't pulled out they shouldn't even be touching should they or no no okay and okay. my suggestion here is to because originally the carburetors were supplied with with those screws uh, uh, AUC twenty seven eighty threes maybe and they had lock nuts on them. So, I've changed those to, oh, to this all yeah. four of them to, to, to yeah. springs. Yeah. Okay. I right. got those from oh, okay. So we're past that. The next thing, or maybe the first thing, is to suggestion I gave to somebody else who's taking spray carburetor cleaner and spraying it between the head and the manifold, yeah. the manifold and the heat shield, the heat shield, the spacer okay. blocks on the spacer blocks okay. between the spacer blocks and the carburetors, <laughs> you know, uh, around the shafts. Um, looking looking for a change in RPM. I mean, what's going to happen when, when you find that leak? Well, okay. either it's going to speed up or slow down. Depends on what, what you're using to spray and uh, and how well the car is tuned. Okay. So it might, it might speed it up. It might kill it. But if it does one of those two things, you know, hey, I'm in the area that there's a problem. Okay. After that, then we have to take the carburetors off. And there's three more things. There's the throttle disc itself. Does it close all the way? You have to look at it. 1972 only throttle discs had a notch on the bottom of them. And, and uh, they got rid of that the next year. But if someone's trying to, to put the carburetors back together and, do, and replace the throttle disc um, and they cut a little notch in there, if the notch is too big, 
then air is going to go through there. You can't okay. you can't shut it off. That's only seventy two, and so it's a little notch in the bottom. Of the, otherwise, the throttle discs are are um, are all but round and and should close. So you want to you know, you want to look through there and make sure there's no no light. If there is, you back off the screws. AUC 1358s, back those, those screws off a little bit, snap the thing shut, tighten them up again, um, make sure that they're still splayed so they can't come out. And then check the overrun valve. We talked about the overrun valve, the spring-loaded valve on the throttle disc. I don't think I have one. Okay, all right. Well, it's, sometimes those have been replaced. Yeah. Uh, the throttle disc with, without those, but if they are there and the spring's weak, yeah. it can pull open at a real low vacuum. Okay. And lastly, uh, lastly, we've got the position of the of the bushings in the body, and in the in the bushing should be pressed right up against the the inside diameter of the of the of the throttle body. Okay. If they're if they're back, if they're back, then air can get around. Uh, around the shaft, okay. even, even though the disc is closed. So those are the things to, it, it's one of those things. Okay, one sort of related question as well, I was gonna ask you, the the vacuum advance, do you, you really, like some people seem to run their cars with them and some people just dis, disconnect them and they're happy without them. So what what's your thoughts on that? Prior to 1968, the vacuum advance wasn't necessary for running. It was better for running. It improved drivability. Okay. But race cars don't have them. No, of course, they're running flat out all, all the time. T-types don't, don't have them. They run fine. So you don't need it. But after 1967, 68 through 80, the vacuum advance has something to do with, with the advance. And by the time we get to 72, it's altogether different. It's no longer ported vacuum, it's manifold vacuum. Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah. And, and almost all of those vacuum units are, have failed anyway. But when, when they failed, then your idle's real crappy and real low, which is not your problem. No. Um, but, um, but you can always take the tube that goes to the vacuum advance and purse your lips around it and draw a vacuum. And, and if you have to have the cap off and just watch and the plate on the, that holds the points should rotate. I don't know yeah, my, my, mine works. So I'm just wondering what your opinion on whether- Leave it on, leave it yeah. on, absolutely. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okie doke. Where, where are you from, Bill? Uh, Gatineau, Quebec, right out of, out of Ottawa. I, 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 knew, I knew you were from Canada. I got, <laughs> I got the accent, but I, I, I couldn't figure out where. Okay. okay. So here we got uh, Tony Wisely. Has anyone had any issues with the digital speedometer? So he's asking it again. Uh, this pertains to MG, uh, MGs that keeps blowing up the speedometer. Should I convert to digital or should I stay analog? So are, are you are you on here? Yes, I'm still here. Oh, okay. All right. So you have you have a car and you have changed both the tech and the speedo to a digital unit? No. No. Okay. We're wondering whether we should keep it analog or convert to digital. Well, I'd keep it analog. What's the problem that you've got that, that's causing you to, to wonder whether you should change? We've blown two cables and two tachometers. And the first one, I mean, a speedometer, sorry. The first one ended up spinning like a clock. Yeah. Until the needle eventually popped off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. And the second one just, it gave out completely. Like it was going, it kept flickering and then nothing. It went straight back to zero and it hasn't come back since. And that's because the cable snapped. Possibly, probably, yeah. Probably. It's a brand new so, cable. So remember that inside the Speedo, there are two units. There's the speedometer, which is springs and magnets. And there's the odometer, which is pawls and gears. Um, so, so my guess is that your odometer isn't working either. And that's because you bought a used unit and you put it in, but it wasn't, yeah. a, good, it wasn't a good used unit. So you could take both of those units, if you have them both, 
and send them both to West Valley Instruments uh, in um, Pat. Where, where's uh, Pat from California? Where, where's West Valley Instruments? Riverside, are they up in San Francisco? Do you know? Or David Knock, are you still here? He's in LA. Okay, all right. And Los he has Angeles. An excellent here. website. More okay. be happy to take your money and make that speedometer better than new. Yeah. So anyway, so that's that's the that's the first trick is to is to get get a good speedo in there. And the second one is to what what year? I can't remember what year you told me the car was. It is a 73. 73. Um, is is it got st a standard gearbox or overdrive gearbox? Overdrive. Okay, so buy another overdrive cable, and make sure that you you um, allow as much room underneath as you can to get as big a radius as you can where that cable comes out of the speedo. The tighter the tighter that cable bends, the the greater chance there is of the of the inner cable snapping. But I think what's happened um, is your. I is I wanted to tell you that we have that elbow, that little box that goes on the transmission. So it goes straight okay. away from the transmission to the front. Okay. So those those fail. And, and so th since those are really expensive, I suggest to everybody, standard or overdrive, that you use the overdrive cable, which does not use the box. And the box, the box attaches. It just, it just get rid of the box and the, in the, in the, just take the cable and, and bring the cable out. There's a, there's a even a screw hole, quarter twenty eight screw hole in the cross member, uh, for a, a little uh, uh, J, uh, a little um, a P, P clamp uh, to hold the, to hold the, uh, the cable in place. But what happened? I mean, this armchair analysis at a thousand miles. Um, is that the first speedo went bad? You bought another speedo, which wasn't very good, and so the second speedo slowed down, put too much tension on the new cable, snapped the new cable. So yeah, it kind of sounds like it. So um, you know, I mean, it's it's always I always default to the to the original stuff. Um, I, I I just like the original stuff, but. Um, I know people do have GPS speedos. I knew I know they have those. So it looks exactly. I think I think Morris can do that at West Valley Instruments. They put I don't know I don't know how it works. Satellites until the until they get shot down or something. And and uh, it always gives you an accurate um, uh, readout of your speed. So I would like to say that the speedometer was not the correct one for the car nor transmission it was the it fit the dash it was a replacement that we had an extra storage from my father had bought out uh mg dealership up in mansfield used dealership i mean mm -hmm. and um so we have a whole bunch of extra parts and stuff we're just trying to get this car running and run perfect it, it was not calibrated whatsoever Okay, so does your does your transmission does it have a dipstick, or do you fill it from the side? Dipstick. Okay, so the speedometer that you want has to have down around oh five o'clock on the face. I had to look at the clock to remind myself of where exactly on the face it was. It's it says one two eight zero twelve eighty. If you get a thousand speedo. It's going to read. Um, it's going to read real fast. So you you've got to have you've got to have a twelve eighty speedo. That's right on the face. <clears throat> so so you get yeah because it was always showing that we were going faster than we actually were. So you want to you want a twelve eighty speedo, and and you, you you can have your old one fixed. I mean he's got jillion parts. There used to be a couple of different places around that did speedos, or and there still are some smaller places. But he's a he's a Goliath in the industry now. Um, does really how much would it cost? I can't speak for him, but my guess is two hundred bucks. Okay, thank you. Okie doke. Where where are you calling from? Stores, Connecticut. Okay. All right. Well, Nicinger Instruments used to used to do all that work. 
but the the last big flood that came through um, washed. They were they were in the Bronx. I don't know. It's New York City. Uh, um, they got they got flooded, and and the, they're gone. So it's it's real sad. Okay, Blair, you're up. Hey, John. 1960 A, 1960 MGA's front discs, wife's car. This is important. Stepping on brakes is easy, no problem. Emergency stopping it pulls to the right. Uh, came home from a ride and put an infrared thermometer on the discs. The right side is 130, left side is 170. That's not a lot of difference. So I'm suspecting that uh, that's the reason it pulls to, to the right. Um, the left side um, maybe is fading because it's uh, at a higher temperature now. So anyway, the, the, reason, the reason that that most often, the reason that that happens is the hoses, the hoses start to collapse on the inside. How new are the hoses? No idea. Change the hoses. I'm on it. That's, that's, I'm sure that, that, that's it. A couple more comments though, because the inside, the inside diameter of the hose collapses and when you go to put on the brakes, you just get a, a difference in pressure um, between the b between the calipers. Um, and also, you want to make sure you got plenty of free play on the on the brakes. And yep. are you using real fluid or silicone fluid? Uh, I think it's dot four. Okay. Real fluid. Real yeah. fluid. Okay. All right. So just make sure you got a half an inch of pedal pedal free play, uh, because if they're if if the brakes are like on all the time. Then, then yes, they're heating up, and and maybe your your idea about the fade is is of, of some concern. And surprise, surprise, since I, I already said this in the in the beginning, but since or maybe I did the last time, a couple of weeks ago is a real nice day. So since no good deed goes unpunished, I got my MGA out waiting for something to happen, parked on the right side of a uh, oh, F three hundred and fifty oh. or something. And the guy pulls out of the parking lot. Never, never saw my car. I shouldn't have parked there. But anyway, didn't see my car. Crunched the left front. I, I my Sev Marshall lamps that I've had in my car since 1980. Now one of them's broken. I'm. I know I'll never get another one that looks the same as that. So it's time for LEDs. So I was thinking of you yesterday. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I gotta get some LED headlights. But that that's that's okay too. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I'm sorry about that. And it was horrible. Oh, hey, but you know, it's, the car is drivable and, you know, yeah. yeah. Hey, I, I did see 154 people at 743 Eastern time. Hey, that's exactly the number I have written down. So, okay. yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. All right. Thanks for the info. I'll call Cecilia in the morning. Yep. All right. So, we're going to our next one here. We got John Mine, 1975. Oh. That was that was to help me out understand an earlier question, but I don't know what that is. So um, anyway, oh oh, I, I did I did that rebuild of the charcoal filter and bought a replacement and bought replacement aquarium charcoal. Okay, that works. That does work. Um, and Pat from California, uh, the 1976 newer vehicles require emission tests in California. I used to be a licensed emission instructor. So, yeah. So, you know, I've got this story. I don't know if it's true or not from in the early days of emission testing. And there was a guy in Greensboro, North Carolina, I think is Greensboro, might have been um, Winston Salem. And, and he put a, a fuel injection on his car, but it had to get smocked. So he took it down and they opened the bonnet. First of all, they put the sniffer in the tailpipe, passed with flying colors, no problem at all. Open up the bonnet, doesn't look the same as the books say it should look. Therefore, of course, they failed him. And he said, but this is the rare, um, this is the rare model that, that had fuel injection. And they said, well, we don't have in our book, so there's nothing we, we can do because you don't have a sticker on the car that says anything. So he went home and made a sticker and, and printed it out and put it on his car. I mean, we're dealing in 1980 here. 
um, and um, and put the put the sticker on his car that that identified it as as an imaginary uh, spurious um, uh, fuel injected MGB, and with that in information and going to a, a different testing center because they weren't all connected at the time, he passed. Maybe it's just a story, but sounds good. Mike C, I rebuilt a charcoal filter too, based on John Twist's YouTube video. Thank you. I could barely blow through it before rebuilding and after it was fine. The filters had disintegrated and it become somewhat solid. So yeah, it's just, it's really easy. To just take it apart and do it. So um, um, Pat G, Evaporative canisters use activated charcoal. It's not just plain charcoal. What's the difference, Pat? What's the difference between between the the, the charcoal? I thought charcoal was charcoal. John, I, I don't know what the chemical process is. Oh, okay. But, um, you remember the old ads for Terryton cigarettes? They bragged about the activated charcoal being the same charcoal that was used to filter the air in the uh, space capsules we sent to the moon. Okay. So it's it's chemically treated. Okay. Is my understanding. Okay, all right. So okay. Uh, it will absorb the fuel vapors, but maybe a chemist could tell us. I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I thought charcoal was charcoal, but, but so, so. Don't take your charcoal briquettes and bust them up and put them in your charcoal canister. <laughs> Buy fish charcoal. So, um, uh, DJ, to me, hi, John, with the dates of the next Zoom meeting. It's next week, Monday, and that'll that'll put us back on track um, already, already next week, Monday. Mike C., I disassembled the anti run on valve on my midget. Uh, I would not recommend anyone do that. It was hard to get it back together and I sealed it up again. I had to use silicone to get it, uh, use, had to use silicone to finally get it sealed up. Uh, there really isn't any, anything inside that, that can go wrong. That's the anti run on belt. That's correct. It's just that little tip on the side that breaks off. That's the frustrating part there, so. Um, I got an answer to the activated charcoal. Yeah. Yeah. Glory went online. It says here activated charcoal is a powder comprised of wood, bamboo, coal, or coconut shells that have been burned at a very high temperature. In contrast, regular charcoal combines coal, peat, wood, pulp, petroleum, and coconut shells. As the name tells us, activated charcoal is charcoal that is activated by exposure to high heat. Okay. The other, the other thing, John, and most important for its function in the canister is activated charcoal has much more surface area than the charcoal powder that you're going to get by crushing up briquettes. Okay. And it doesn't have the starch that has used to hold the briquettes together. Uh, I, I, should I should never have said anything about charcoal briquettes. Oh, you'll I, eat that I'll one forever. <laughs> I will. I will. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I, I know. Keep cooking your steaks. I, I know that you can use the charcoal from your charcoal canister, light charcoal in your grill. It just takes a lot of it because it, it turns red and it turns, it turns to white ash afterwards. But you were right about the fish tank charcoal. That would work in your charcoal canister. Yep. So, Doc Rosevere, I answered your questions about the hose. Nathaniel, my 69 MGB, I assume, would load up at idle like that, and adjusting the mixture fixed it completely. So I think Nathaniel's kicking back to something that we talked about, the guy who, who uh, talked about his idle being at 15, and then 12, and then 11, and then nine and then six and then and then and then you gotta kick the throttle to to do it but adjusting the mixture would do it i i, I think that we already talked about that so and someone don bueller tried to make a paypal send me a check don um tried to make a paypal um um contribution and it said they're experiencing temporary difficulties Okay. Yeah, John. Yes. 
I've been trying to pay something to you for all your great work for about a month, and I get that same error. Oh, okay. Well, then that's something on your end, then, apparently. So yeah, you, that's what I figured. If, if someone online, Marty, said that, you know, you got to do something here. And I tried it again, and I get the same error. Okay. Does anyone else have that error? Well, the question is how to solve it. And um, um, I suggested that you uh, go to PayPal and then look it up under University Motors LTD, search by name, maybe. Just go directly. Don't go through John's. Page. Uh, yeah, from John's, it works for me. The link that I sent you works. But if you just go to PayPal and then search by University Motors LTD, it should it should still come up. I I don't have a problem finding it, so I can't tell from your computer what's going on. Okay, I'll try that, Marty. Thank you. It, it, it often sure. it, it often takes my email address. I think it works on email addresses, and my email address is my name, John Twist at University Motors Ltd. com. So, okay, thanks. I did one a half an hour ago through the new University Motors dot online page, and it worked fine. Thank you. Glad Thank to you. hear that. Thank you, Dave. I'll read your name next time for sure. So, anyway, we've got a great a great one here, and this is bleeding a clutch. Bill, or Bill, are you still on? We're on down to ninety six. Oh, because it's after. Good grief, it's after nine o'clock. Um, Phil, are you still on? You asked about bleeding the clutch. Whether you're on or not, I'm gonna talk about it. So um, let's see, bleeding the clutch can be really, really time consuming and frustrating. Everyone knows that. So when you're, when you're rebuilding or replacing pieces in your clutch system, it's not necessary to um, replace the master cylinder, you can rebuild it. You can rebuild it in place. You don't have to take it apart. You just have to have a pair of snap ring pliers, get the snap ring out, pull the piston out, pull the, pull the main um, uh, cup out and clean it, clean it all, all out and get a kit and put it all back together. Same thing with a slave. You can undo the slave from the side of the gearbox and if you if you um, put air into the bleeder, it'll blow the blow the piston and the in the cup out. You can go to Napa and buy a new cup. It's an inch and an eighth, I think, cup. Can't get a boot from Napa, but you can get a you can get the you can buy a rebuild kit for nine bucks or something from Moss or Abbey and Spares or somebody. You can rebuild it just dangling in the hose. Just re rebuild it there. Anyway. No matter what you do, when you go to bleed the system, you take the bleeder out of the bleed hole and you use your finger. Take your finger off the bleeder. You call you you are the you are the you are the master here, even though you're working with the slave cylinder, and you call up to whoever's sitting in the, in the driver's seat and you tell them down. And it's not like an emergency stop. You don't have to slam the pedal to the floor. Just push the pedal to, to the floor. The clutch pedal. I have blood brakes and clutches when the person inside the car was pushing the wrong pedal. Of course, you don't get very far very fast. Anyway, finger off, pedal down, finger on, in, instead of putting the bleeder in, finger on, pedal up, all the way up, count out 20 seconds. One, two, three, four. I won't go to 20 because it takes too long. Five, six. It just it seems like it takes forever. Finger off, pedal down, finger on, pedal up, wait 20 seconds. After you've done this four, certainly by five or six, Fluid's gurgling out of the slave. Now, instead of putting your finger back on, run the bleeder in. Tighten it, pedal up. Open the bleeder, down, close the bleeder, up. Wait a couple of seconds. That's it. That's it. And you only have to bleed it just a little bit, and it works every time. But if you're in there going pump, 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 
you'll never you'll never make it work, especially if you're using silicone fluid. Oh my gosh, that stuff aerates so easily. Then you just have to come to a stop and wait till the next day and go go back at it again. But bleed it with your finger the first five or six times until you get a big burst of fluid and wait. During the time that you wait, the vacuum in the master cylinder bore will draw fluid from the master cylinder reservoir and fill up that fill up that vacuum with fluid. You have to wait. That's the trick. Works every time. From Clay Robinson, my 1975 MGB maybe, uh, with a master cylinder unit way forward provides limited space for carb conversion options. Yes, I don't, I don't know what the difference is between a 75 and a 76. I never figured it out, but um, you can get thinner spacer blocks. Are you still on, Clay? Clay's not there. You can get thinner spacer blocks to go between the carburetors and the intake manifold. Of course, you got to shorten. Okay, great. Uh, of course, you got to you got to shorten up the uh, the studs. If the spacer blocks are too thin, you got to cut some slits in the heat shield to allow the linkage to work. But that's one way out of it. Another way is to take the hemispherical foam filters. The front the front one fits on just fine, and the rear one you um, adjust adjust it with like your fist <laughs> or your heel of your hand or a hammer um, and that'll work. I'm not sure that the, the conical filters from k and are extremely expensive. You can buy a kit. I know Moss has a kit with those, but they're, they're pushing a hundred bucks each or something. And there's one that's offset up, up to the top. The rear one's offset to, to the top. And, um, I know that works on the 76 through 80s. So it's anyway, really so, tight. So you, John, oh, you're really tight with K and So you're saying you're thinking like H uh, HS fours go to go to a side a side float bowl type carburetor and do no, this. No, th that 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 won't make it. I don't think I don't think that is going to make any difference. I don't know what the overall um, width of those are. My guess is the same. My 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 guess is um, um, that the that the length of the carburetors is the same HS and HIF. Um, no, it's the spacer blocks. Those black spacer blocks. Um, you can you can put those if you're if you're really careful and measure and put a line on it. You can put them on a belt sander and just cut them down in in size. I mean it's nasty and stuff flying all, all over, but um, you just have to have two. Two parallel surfaces when you're done. So if I decrease yeah, them is, by this... half their half their thickness, would that be too much? Oh, that that would work great. That would work great. But now the linkage won't work. The linkage is going to hit the hit the um, um, heat shield. Heat shield. Just couldn't remember the name. The, the, it's going to hit the heat shield, so you're going to have to take your your die grinder, your cutoff wheel, uh, your Dremel tool, and cut some slits in 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 there to accommodate the the fingers. That's all. Got it. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, John. This is the issue I've been dealing with with my conversion on my '78 car, and I I finally looked at at the Moss catalog, I've tried different ones and bought them and sent them back. I just bought the K&N $300 for the two. And Wait, I'm looking. Inflation, yeah. Um, okay. Last year, they were uh, 105. Now they're 140. Yeah. Well, that, but, um, that'll I'm do looking it. looking at the pancake ones, but I just heard you commenting on those pancake ones. They have no filter area. There's no filter area. No, those they look cool, but they're just they're useless. Unless you're ready to to take the filters out every time you drive the car and wash them. I mean, it, that's you won't do it. So so that that offset that offset 
uh, filter that you get from K&N that goes on the rear, rear carburetor, that will work. Okay, it's really tight though. And I don't know if my engine had shifted or something, but I, I, I can barely get that thing to hit without, it's constantly hitting the, the servo. Well, the engine, the engine may have moved some, you know, then you've got, you've got the, the engine mounts uh, and then you get the brackets and those brackets tear and the mounts collapse, um, you know, getting the engine moved over to one side is a, a real bear. But I think, I think what I do is take those spacer blocks and, and scribe a line on the outside as best you can and get, get a belt sander and just, but they they got to be parallel. They 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 can't be on a V because um, then it isn't going to seal. Um, you have a vacuum leak. But if you took a quarter of an inch off each one, you'd you'd be home free. Well, that was what I was looking at last night as I was trying to pre-fit these uh, these K and Ns, and I was just frustrated at this point. The old way I used to do it back in the 80s was exactly what you talked about is those round foam ones and you just dent one side of it so it, yep. it clears the, <laughs> yep. I may just go back to that. I wanted a better look, but uh, you know, I, I can go with a dented filter, I guess, if take, all fails. Take the uh, take those spacer blocks and just run a little bit, a little bit of distance off them. But it almost, it, it, it almost always works. Something else is going on. The position of the engines is wonky. I don't, I don't know how, and I don't know even how to tell. What take a take a tape measure from the from from the from from the fender to the to the valve cover, and from the valve cover to to the fender, and see if it's. I I've never done that ever, um, but you know, I, something something's up. So, well, you know. I had bought brand new mounts on this thing. I just dropped the motor in. You know, this has been an ongoing project. I just dropped the motor in two weeks ago, and I fought those mounts on that car for the <laughs> better part of three days. Do you have the spacers? Do you have the spacers on top of the mounts? Do you have the two spacers on top of each mount? Okay, so, yes. take, so take the spacers out uh, under out from underneath the al alternator and that, that may kick the engine um, um, the other way. I don't, I mean, you can't, you can't take can the spacers. You, can you take the spacers out? I mean, I, I was, sure, yeah, I was sure. always worried about making sure everything was just like it came off. Well, fair enough, but it's, it, it, they are, they are for spacing. And, um, and, and so, you go, I mean, try it, try it. It's cheap. You know, you know let's do the cheapest, easiest stuffers. And you can get to those. You can take those out. You can't take the, you can't take the spacers out on the, on the driver's side. So, so I, I don't know if that would do it or not, but I, you know, hey, we, we, we've, we've covered some ideas here, so. I, I, was, I was cursing out uh, the English when I was putting that motor back in. I said, who designs a mount like this? Well, yeah, and, and the engine bracket, the bracket doesn't have a gusset welded in it, so they tear. And sometimes they tear so badly that that they that they tear all the way, and then the engine the engine actually falls. And uh, I remember one that we had come in the shop where the right side of the engine was being supported um, by the by the oil uh, the oil inlet pipe to the to the oil filter. That that's what was holding the engine in place. You know, it's like just a gusset, just this little tiny welded gusset on those engine brackets, and and even the new ones don't have it. So it, anyway, anyway, I, I'm uh, we are at nine eighteen. So I, I I just want to cruise along here. Um, thanks for Nathaniel for, for the tip on loading up. Okay, got it. Uh, how to contact John Twist? I used the spring in the hose trick. It worked great. Uh, John, what's your phone number again? Six one six three zero seven. Six seven three seven. Don't call me tonight. Six one six three zero seven six seven three seven. I'm on Eastern Time. Uh, save the date, University Motors Party. Uh, so we are down. We're about. We've got some conversations going on in here. Uh, 
Here's a link to Ebbing and Spears. They, they, they've got a wonderful supply of, of uh, parts. Um, let's see. Uh, if I do, in fact, rework the block and pistons in situ, um, but I can see the engine mounts also need replacement, uh, how doable is that project? This is from David um, this is from California, uh, who, is, who bought the car because it was such a good deal. And now he's talking about selling it to somebody out of state so he doesn't have to do, do all this. Um, but you can you can do you can do almost the whole thing in place, the whole engine. I mean, you can't turn a crankshaft, can't can't uh, can't do do that. But you can you can hone it and you can put rings in it and everything. So, um, all right. So we are we are down we are down to it. Um, um, I need a new radiator for my 56 MGA. Any suggestions? You can have your MGA uh, radiator record. It probably costs you $600 right now, probably. Um, you, can, you can get an aluminum one that cools so much better. Doesn't look original at all. Looks like it came out of a Subaru. But if you can get beyond that, it's, they are dynamite. Um, well, Any suggestions on where to get the aluminum well, one from, John? Well, um, Moss or Abingdon um, or Cecilia. I haven't checked Abingdon. I've checked Moss. Um, Cecilia at Scarborough Fair in okay. Rhode Island. Those All right, I'll give Cecilia a call, too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. John Tershak, we've got... Um, does anyone have a body part that still has the original glacier blue paint that I can borrow paint codes? Um, so we're looking for glacier blue. So the people that do have the original paint codes, um, and he, I think he's got all of them, almost all of them, and that's Paul Deershaw, a sports car craftsman in Arvada, Colorado. So there's that plate, the front splash apron that goes right behind the rear wheel that keeps all the muck and stuff from getting thrown up inside the rear fender or inside the front fender. When you take that off, the back side hasn't been attacked by uh, the elements or air or the sun. So I guess the, the air is one of the four elements. Um, but it hasn't either. It hasn't been attacked by the sun either, and he's got those hanging up all over in his showroom, um, in in all the different colors. Oh my gosh, all the different colors, and he sure has. He sure has glacier blue. Um, so you'll have to talk to Sports Car Craftsman to see if they can have, I don't know, paint mixed for you. If if they'll, you know, if you can. Give them a thousand dollar down payment, or you know, to to they'll refund you when you send the panel back. I don't know, you know, something rather, but um, that's the only person I know of right off the top of my head that would have uh, something in in glacier blue. Although sometimes on the inside of the car, if your car was painted originally glacier blue, up underneath the dash, underside of the underside of the trunk lid. You know, there's some places that that don't uh, that are painted that don't get sunlight, but you can't match paint anymore. You just you, you can't. You, you used to do that. You used to be able to go to a book and you'd order the paint, and that was what Rinshed Mason. That's what that's what uh, uh, whoever it was making the paint uh, PPG said that it was. I remember calling the uh, the paint library for PPG for um, and and they they uh, they said, well, we don't have it exactly, but we got the eye match. And it was always just spot on because whatever color you've chosen, some other cars also used. So anyway, the colors trying to get original colors is very, very difficult right now. Um, here we go, paint paint ships. Paint chips, you know, you, you got the paint chips, but those have changed. Those have been lined up against another page uh, for, for, you know, 68 years. 
And, and so chemically it's changed and it isn't the same color anymore. But it, it's really tough. So anyway, um, Ben Andrews says, speaking of emission stickers, Abingdon Spears has, has them for the 72 through 74B, um, but with HS4 carbs, so that's interesting. Um, so anyway, um, some people, I, I know some of those stickers are available, but we are at 924 and, and um, we've got some more comments here about activated charcoal and um, that is about it. Um, we've talked about my phone number and I did, I did, I got down to the end here. I got down to Connor, how would I contact you? What a problem. Uh, um, are these Zoom meetings the best place to, to do that? But uh, Connor, you can call me if you're still on. Uh, you can call me tomorrow, 616-307-6737. It's all over my website. If you Google my name, John Twist, and put an MG on there also, you get you know 1.8 million hits within the first millisecond. Uh, and someplace in there, you, you, can, you can work back and, and find my phone number. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for tonight. Um, what did we talk about? So we went through, uh, we would thank the people who had hit the PayPal button. Thank you very kindly. Talked about the PayPal a little bit because uh, that one gentleman was having trouble. That was okay because I'm supposed to mention it a couple of times during the program anyway. So we talked about emissions, not everything about emissions, but a lot about emissions. And um, uh, you can take off the air pump, but don't take off the the charcoal canister, that's a real good thing to have on there. And then, um, then we answered all of our questions here. The, dig the digital speedos, oh, that was interesting. I didn't even know those were, those were out yet, that, or I didn't even know that, that they were available, but we did talk about West Valley Instruments. And there's other places around too that do, do Smith's um, instrument rebuilding. So that's about it. So it's 9.30, 9.26. We still got 67 diehards on. <laughs> um, you know? So anyway, I, I'm, uh, I'm gonna switch over to uh, uh, gallery view. Um, Marty makes me go on speaker view so, so that when we copy these and put them up on YouTube, it doesn't look like a, a bunch of postage stamps. Um, actually, <laughs> the person that's speaking actually gets some, some distance. So anyway, I want to thank everybody for being on tonight and hanging on for so long, those of you who did. We didn't hear from uh, Rodolfo from Monterey, Mexico, or uh, um, uh, David from uh, Perth, Australia, but maybe next time. And our next meeting is going to be on uh, next week. And as soon as I get the information about the summer party and how you can reserve a room at the summer party, uh, we'll do that. Marty and I are working on the on the uh, registration form as we, not as we speak, but we will be again tomorrow. So thanks everybody. You can unmute yourself if you want. Say hello. Say goodbye. Thanks, John. Thanks as always, John. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Always fun. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Nice to see you, Greg. On tonight, Thank you, John. Yep. Good yep. night, John. Hey, good night. Good night, Crystal. Good night. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. We'll get out. Thank you, John. Next week. Next week. Everybody have a good evening. <laughs> and drive your, drive your MG. There's still on there, honey. I know I can't. I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> drive your MG. As often as you can. A show on, on Sunday. Thanks. <laughs>